Welcome to How to Pitch to Investors with 13 Slides. I'm Nathan Gold, Chief Coach at The Demo Coach. Now I know you've paid for this video, so I'm not going to waste your time with who I am, what I've done, and who I've helped. If you want information about my background, please feel free to go to my website at democoach.com and you can find out everything you want. This is about you. This is about giving you a model deck that you can use when pitching investors of all shapes and sizes. Whether friends and family, angels, or venture capitalists, it makes no difference. You need a deck that's tightly rehearsed and easy to deliver so that everyone you pitch to will get your message and ask you questions that are meaningful and relevant to the opportunity that you're presenting them with. I almost forgot to mention that you don't have to take copious notes on the video you're seeing here right now because all the visuals I'm using will be in a PDF document that you can download at the end of this video. So let's get started. This presentation has two parts. The title is How to Pitch to Investors with 13 Slides. First thing I'm going to do is give you the 13 slides. Once you have those, you'll be able to use that as a model to make up your deck. And then let's talk about the how part. Because I find that most people don't spend much time on the how you pitch to investors. It's more about what you're pitching with the deck. And that's where people spend most of their time. So when people come to me and they're asking for coaching, usually the middle part of the deck is okay. They know about their business and what they want to say, but the opening is weak and the closing is weak. And we'll talk here in this session about how to make a really memorable opening and a very, very good close so that people never forget who you are or what the opportunity is that you've presented them with. Okay, let's get started. So this investor pitch deck that I'm about to give you with 13 slides is a model. That's all. It's a model. It works though. It's a model that you should be able to deliver to any investor in 10 minutes or less. Usually 10 minutes is a good rule of thumb to be able to pitch your entire deck. There are many organizations around the world that give you 10 minutes, 7 minutes, 5 minutes, or a certain limited period of time to pitch your investment opportunity. If you can do it in 10, then you can work it back to 7 and 5 and maybe even less. But 10 minutes without any questions is about the amount of time it should take to get through this deck. Let's take a look. Now this is just a model, but it's a model that works. And here's an example of a company that I just recently helped a few months ago, Glue Networks. They use this model that I'm about to share with you right now, and they raised four and a half million dollars in angel money. That's right, only angels. They started out at a million and were oversubscribed. They went to two and oversubscribed, went to four and oversubscribed, and decided that four and a half, that was it, and they were again oversubscribed at four and a half. And this is a company from Sacramento that everybody wanted to move down to the Bay Area, and they said, no, 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 we're staying in Sacramento but yet they were able to raise four and a half million dollars and it was just angel money. How about that? So let's take a look at what they used. Now, first of all, who says that 13 slides is the right number of slides? Well, let me back this up for you a little bit. First of all, there are two people in the world that would say 13 is the wrong number. The person on the left is Guy Kawasaki, if you haven't recognized him. If you present to Garage Ventures and Guy Kawasaki or anybody on his team, go to his website, read his blog about the 10 slides that you should use, and use those 10 slides. Don't use any more. On the right side of your screen is Michael Moritz from Sequoia Capital. They also have a 10 slide deck that they like you to use when you present to them. Aside from Garage Ventures and Sequoia Capital, everyone else that you present to, you can use 13. And the deck that I'm about to present to you comes from David Rose. David Rose is the CEO and founder of AngelSoft. He's also a serial entrepreneur and a venture capitalist himself. In fact, David presented at TED in 2007. You can go watch his presentation. It's fantastic. He spends 18 minutes about what investors are looking for. And the last bit is spent on the deck that I'm going to share with you right now. And as I share it with you, I've put a few of my own twists on it based on information that I've gathered from people using this deck over the last four to five years. Now, interestingly enough, a few months ago, I ran into David Rose at a conference. 
I couldn't believe it. I just bumped into him accidentally. And I talked to him about using his deck to help my clients. And he was absolutely flabbergasted that somebody actually using his information. I think he was really just pulling my leg. But he's given me carte blanche and total permission to use his name and his deck anywhere and everywhere. So feel free to thank him and, uh, and the AngelSoft group for this model deck. All right, let's take a look at the deck itself. Remember, 13 slides. Number one, the first slide is your logo, your name, and your title. That's it. You don't need the date. You don't need who you're presenting to. You don't need all the information about how to contact you because frankly, they don't care about that at this point. And everyone knows that you can modify a keynote or a PowerPoint presentation minutes before the change that you're presenting to them. Just leave it alone. All you need is your logo, your name, and your title. Now this is the slide where people blow it. They say something like this. Thank you very much for your time here today. I'm Nathan Gold, CEO of Fish on Fire. Let's get started. And bang, you go into the next slide. This is not good. This is a missed opportunity. And in a bit, after I get through the deck, I'm gonna to talk to you about what you can do in the opening. And this is where you do your opening. It's not only the slide with your logo and your name and your title, but this is where you set it up. This is where you put the hook in. This is where you do the grabber so the audience will want to pay attention. More on that later. Slide number two. This is your business overview. Very simply put, one or two or three lines. You don't want to go into chapter and verse in lots of detail, but this is where you reemphasize the the problem or the unmet need that you're solving with your business. The questions that you see on the screen here, what business are you in, what problem do you solve, why does the problem exist, what advantages do you have, why should anyone care, these are the kinds of questions that should spur the answers to what you say on this slide. Okay? So that's it. Business overview. Very quick, just to give people an understanding of what you do. Slide number three. This is your team. Now that you've put the business overview out there, now you need to tell people who you are. Very quickly, very succinctly, no long drawn out discussions. Remember, you only have 10 minutes to give these 13 slides. So when it gets to your team, maybe you talk briefly about yourself and maybe one or two other people and just summarize that the team together, blah, 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 will have 15 years and this and that and whatever, but just make it quick and simple. Now, my favorite way to do a team slide is like you see here right now. Pictures of each of the people in, on the team, and I mean team, not management team, not executive team, the team. Because when you're an early stage startup, you may not have a management team. You may not have an executive team. Well, don't worry about it. But you do have a team, and it's at least you, plus whoever else, and your advisors. So here's where I would suggest you put the logos of the people that work for you or that are working with you on your team in a collage all over the place and then maybe you pick out one or two of these as you're talking to the investor because that would be the point of interest. Don't lay out all the degrees and everything else that people have. You can mention that as you talk. Slide number four is your market opportunity. This is where you need to be very careful. Most people want to know how big is the problem? What's the economic impact of your solution? Can you quantify what it is you're offering? And most importantly, many people will come into an investor presentation and say, if we just get a half of a half of a percent of the market, you know, the total available people in the world will be rich. That's a top-down approach to discussing what your market opportunity is. Investors don't like that. You want to use a bottom-up approach. A bottom-up approach starts with who the users are, who the people are that are going to buy your products or services. You start adding up those people. You start at the bottom of the pyramid and you start adding it all up and then the total sum of all those people is your market. When you start at the bottom and work your way up, you show that you've really thought about who it is you're going after. Anybody can go to Google and say, how many people are using social networking today? 
And then you come in and say, if we just get 1% of those people using social networking today, according to Google or according to Gartner Group or whomever, then we'll be rich. We'll be a $100 million business. Don't go there, folks. Investors know it's too easy to come up with that kind of a number. Start at the bottom and work your way up. And a little pet peeve of mine, just so you know, it's not bottoms up. Bottoms up, and I'm amazed at how many financial people say bottoms up approach to financial planning or market sizing is. No, it's not bottoms up is when you take a glass and you tip it and you drink. It's bottom up. So don't let that little grammar slip up. Maybe embarrass you with somebody that's a stickler for words like me. Slide number five. This is the all important slide where you talk about your product or your service. Some people have a cause, but in general, the people I talk to have a product or a service. Now on this slide, be sure and remember to put the name of your product or service. I'm amazed at how many times I run into people's decks and we get to this slide and I say, so what's the name of the product? And they look at me and say, oh my God, we forgot to put the name of the product there. So be sure and put the name of the product on your slide. Now there's two things you can do on this slide. One is, to have screen captures of your product, if it's one you can do that way. If it's not screen captures, then maybe photographs. If it's a hardware product you have, you can take some photographs of its parts or inside the parts and put that on this slide. That very often can help you with talking points about what it is you want to draw people's attention to. Now, if you do screen captures because you have software that can be displayed on a computer and you can capture those screens, I suggest you use Snagit. Snagit allows you to not just capture the screen, but it allows you to capture the page. So that means if you have a scrolling page in your demo of your product, you'll be able to actually scroll down in it when you get to showing that part of your presentation. If someone says, can I see a demo of your product, you'll have screen captures, but not just screen captures, it actually is page captures. All right, snag it. You can use it for 30 days. It's really a great product and can, and can make you look really, really good without having to get online or even have a local version of your product running on the computer that you're using in your presentation, okay? Now, many of you can stand to have something to break up the monotony of slides. Whether you use Keynote or PowerPoint, it makes no difference. You're all using slides and we need something to break it up. Now, I'm very often asked by people should I do a demo in an investor meeting? My answer is always, I don't know, ask. So you look at them and you say, I have a two minute demo of my product. Would you like to see that now or shall we save that for later? If they say show it to me now, bounce out a PowerPoint or click a button that shows the screen captures if that's all you have. Now, a better way to break out of the monotony of having slide after slide after slide in presentations is to use a screen capture utility, something like Camtasia, that allows you to capture the screens so that you can run your demo of your product, if it's software, of course. Run your product demo, capture all the screens, and then edit out all the stuff that you don't need, and then you have a one or a two minute demo that you can run anytime. I would never do a live demo in, an, in a first meeting, in a first investor meeting where these slides are being pitched. I don't think you should do a live demo but playing a recorded version of your demo is perfectly okay. But the most important thing is when you play the version of this demo, make sure that you don't have sound on the demo, unless of course it's music or video, then let sound go. What I usually recommend to people is let the recorded version of your demo stand on its own while you, the presenter, tell people what's happening. For instance, here's an example of a software product that's social related and it helps people to spread the word. Here's the place where you enter in your email addresses and at the bottom is where you can share it on Facebook or Twitter. As soon as it goes off to Twitter, bang, it's up and live in the Twitter sphere and, and that's how you can demo a live product. If you look at the URL in this demo, you'll see that it's a real live demo. It's just recorded and it's playback anytime, anywhere, on a moment's notice. And you also know that the recorded demo only shows the things that are important at that moment. Camtasia is a simple to use product. You can use it for 30 days at no charge. 
and I highly recommend it as a way for you to get your demos in your pocket, whether you run them on your laptop or, or directly off of a thumb drive. Right? So what happens if, you're, if your presentation fails? No problem. You have a copy of your PowerPoint and your video and your thumb drive. You can plug it into anybody's computer and run it automatically. And that's how I would run a demo. Slide number six, this is your business model. This is where you need to tell people how will you make money? How do you expect to make money? This is not your financial projections. This is how you expect to make money. What's your go-to market strategy? Or any of the other questions that you see listed here on the screen. Most importantly, if you can talk about what traction you have in your business right now, that means more to investors than just about anything. They love to see traction. They love to see momentum. So be sure that you talk about what your business model has been, what it's planned to be, and how it's working out so far. Now, this slide doesn't have to be messed up with a whole lot of words. If you have a software subscription model, maybe just put the word subscription on this slide. That may be all you need in order to discuss the fact that we are building our business based on subscriptions. We have a free model, a freemium, and a paid subscription, and you talk about what it is you're looking to do. Don't have to mess it up with a lot of words. Slide number seven is where you get to talk about your strategic relationships. Now, in many early stage startups, you don't have any strategic relationships. You may not have any partners, and certainly you may not have any customers. So this is the only slide in the deck that can be moved to the very end after the last slide in your appendix area if you don't have any. And as your business develops and you get your first partner, slap this slide right back into slot number seven. And this is where you would put any partnerships, any customers, and maybe if you had a letter of intent or, or a memorandum of understanding from a company, it doesn't go a really long way, but you might be able to mention it. And I would just put the logos of the companies here. So that gives you the freedom to talk about what the kind of relationship and partnership is that you have with these companies. And of course, don't I wouldn't expect to go through all of these in one 10-minute presentation. You take a look at who you're presenting to, and if McDonald's is an important company to that person, maybe you say what the relationship is that you have with McDonald's, which could pertain to the opportunity that you're presenting them with. Okay? Slide number eight. The all-important competition slide. Now you have to have this slide. If you don't have this slide, investors will obviously ask you the question and I highly recommend you don't leave it for them to ask. The competition is really important. But remember, you're not there to sell the fact that the competition isn't as good as you. You're not there to give them information about the competition in those 10 minutes that they may already know to prove that you know who your competition is, it needs to be something very simple and very powerful. And if you go by Sales 101, you won't even mention the names of your competitors. So here's an example of how you might use a slide like this. Let's say all these companies on the slide are your competitors. And you look at your investor and you say, we have some formidable competition in the space we're in right now. We have already looked at the strengths and weaknesses of each one of them and I can assure you that at Fish on Fire we have the unique advantage of and then you put in whatever that unique advantage is and you roll on ahead. You get the competition out of the picture. Slide number nine. This is your barriers to entry and if there was one slide in the 13 that confuses people more than anyone, it's this slide for some reason. This is not your barriers to entry. It's not what's keeping you out of the business or keeping you from succeeding. This is the barriers to entry, which is what's keeping other people out of your space. What's to stop another company from hiring 100 engineers to re-engineer what you've done and come up with something that's a tenth of the price? I don't know. But this is the slide where you need to make sure the investor hears what's keeping other people out of your space. Now, intellectual property and patents can sometimes be what a lot of people hang their hats on and say, well, we have the patents. Well, let me just let you in on a little secret here. Just because you have a patent doesn't mean you can enforce it. 
do you have the money to enforce a patent against somebody like a Cisco that's going to maybe use one of your ideas? Can you prove that you're the one that invented it? I mean, hopefully that won't happen. But don't rely only on patents as the barriers to entry to keeping other people out. It's not the name of the game. So you want to talk about how defensible your technology is and don't forget you may want to bring back one or two of the team members into the barriers to entry discussion because who knows uh, maybe you're the top blog on the planet and you just hired away the top uh, video blogger in the world to be your number one and now there's a pretty slim chance that anybody else out there is going to be able to hire that person away and be able to claim that as a barrier to entry for them doing what you're doing so make sure that if you have a team member that has something that might be part of the various entry, bring it back in and mention it on this slide. Number 10 is your financial overview. Now this is a very simple overview. This is nothing detailed. You want to roll everything up because there's really only a couple of points you want to make on this slide. The first one is you want to mention or state the investments that have been made to date and who has made those investments, briefly. Especially if you've got your own investment in it. Investors love when people put their own skin in the game more than just time. Money speaks, euros speak. They do, trust me. Now all you need in the financial overview is a simple top line five year projection. Now I know five years is a really long time. So maybe you can give them three, but it'd be expected to have to answer to years four and five when you get into due diligence, right? We're only talking about the first meeting here. So all you need to do with this chart is to identify your break-even point and your profitability point. As we've done in this chart with color, you can mention that in March of year two, post-funding, we expect to break even, and then in July of year three, post-funding, we expect to be profitable, as you can see from the numbers on this chart. I'd be happy to give you chapter and verse in my extended detail once we get beyond the point where you want to know more about my company. Simple as that. Okay? And you don't have to put the actual years at the top of this because it's very simple to say post-funding, this is what our expectations are. Then you never have to edit this slide. Number 11. This is your last chance. Now remember, this deck has been set up to sell the investor on the opportunity. It's not to just tell them about the opportunity. This is a selling opportunity. And whenever you're selling, normally price and the amount is the very last thing you talk about, right? Especially with a high-end sale, like a, a million or two or whatever you're asking for. So this slide, number 11, is your second to last slide. This is the one where you get to tell people what it is you're going to do with the money you raise. This is what we're going to do with your money. And this is how we're going to give you a return on your investment. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that. We're going to get the salespeople in place, and we're going to bring down that low-hanging fruit. This is where you build that momentum. You might want to use a little timeline to show what you expect to happen over the next 3, 6, 12 months, or however you want to describe it. But this is it. This is the last chance for them to get that enthusiasm and that passion from you about the opportunity, because slide number 12 is the capital request. This is the slide where you want to state the deal. What are you looking for? How much are you looking to raise? Is this a convertible note? Is this a series A? Is it a series B? How much is it? This is the slide where you need to put that number out on the table. Now many people come to me and they say, well we're going to ask for between a half a million and two million. That's a bad idea, folks, because the investor is going to look at you and not know which way to go. If you really have a business that you can build on a half a million investment and you have a real business that you can build on a two million investment, you can at times say to the investor, we have two business opportunities, two ways we can go. We can raise a half a million and do X and Y, or we can raise two million, do X, Y, Z, and something else. So you can lay it out as a choice that way and see whether or not the investor wants to look at one or the other. And you'll know what's happening. You'll know which way they want to go based on how the deal is structured. 
but be aware that most people will typically put a single number out there and then talk about that as being the deal. You don't necessarily have to talk about your exit strategy. You can, I usually like to let that one become one of the questions you get from an investor because most of the investors you're talking to are smart people. They'll know who your potential buyers are. They'll know if you're an IPO candidate. They'll just know. And then finally, there's valuation. I'm often asked, should I put my valuation on the table? Every fiber in my body says, don't put the valuation on the table. That's what the investors are there to do. That's their talent, is to take a look at other deals and other opportunities and compare them to yours and take a look at everything you're doing, all your sales if you have any, and they figure out the valuation. So get coaching on how to answer the question, so what's the valuation you have on your company? Okay, now let's get to the final slide, number 13. You've done all your work, you've just put the deal on the table, you've told them how much you're looking to, to bring in, and now is your conclusion. Slide number 13 is the same as slide number one, except now slide number 13 has all your contact information on it. Your phone number, your email address, and everything else. But this is not the end of the presentation. The end of the presentation is now in your hands. Assuming there have been no questions, for the moment, we'll assume there's been no questions because we had 10 minutes, you need to close. And this is where you close. You close with slide number 13. In conclusion to the 13 slides, here they are in one simple list. I call them the David Rose 13. And you now have a deck that you can work with. It's nothing more than a model, but I can tell you it works. And it'll save you headache. It'll save you the pain of figuring out, well, what slides do I use? Should I, uh, should I talk about this first or that first? This deck has been very well thought out. It's tried and true, and it produces results. Now let's take a look at how to pitch this 13-slide deck. To begin with, the way I look at it, you have three.